Okay, good morning everyone. I'm sorry I'm running a couple minutes late here. We had some engaging conversation over coffee. Coffee in the narthex. It's great. Let's begin with an invocation and with the Our Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, we have been taking a look here at um, chapter 4, which has been titled, um, The One Who Is Always and Only For You. This really is the chapter on Christ. And what we have spent our time doing here to four largely has been looking at Christ as the center of the scriptures. And of course, in American Christianity, in the backdrop, we see that Christ isn't the center of American Christianity. Um, the Christian very often is the center of American Christianity. And so part of Part of our call to reform, part of our role is to call people back to Jesus and to call people, call ourselves, call our neighbors, um, back to the centrality of Jesus, back to the centrality of his cross and the forgiveness of sins. So we left off on page 83, that's where the new material begins, and we've been looking at some positive statements about the atonement of Jesus, um, the death of the one who is true God and true man, who makes atonement for all of our sins, and the, we've looked at some statements from Martin Luther, including this one, the cross alone is our theology. And over on 83, um, let's look at the second full paragraph there. It is amazing, Wolf Mueller writes, that the question, is Jesus preached, has to be asked. But this is the situation in American Christianity. The words of Jesus in Revelation, some of the most misquoted and misapplied words in the Bible, actually apply here. All right, here's the quote from Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I love this. <laughs> Wolf Mueller writes, this is not the door of your heart, <laughs> but the door of the church in Laodicea. See Revelation 3.14 through 22. All right, it is not, Jesus in this, in this text is not knocking on the door of our heart. He's knocking on the door of the church. Jesus is saying to his church, I'm outside. <laughs> Imagine having a, having a Christian church where Christ is outside trying to get in. <laughs> oh my. Wolf Miller continues, if there is anywhere we should find Jesus, it ought to be in and with his church, but he's not here. Jesus is knocking on the door. He's trying to get in. Jesus is saying to his church, I'm outside. Jesus is knocking on the door. He's trying to get in. This is an apt picture of much of American Christianity. The crosses have been removed from the sanctuaries, but worse, the cross has been removed from the teaching and preaching. All right, and now we get back to this kind of reminder of where we began Wolf Mueller's opening critique of American Christianity. A, a, a historical critique and a theological critique cites these four categories, these four influences that really make American Christianity what it is. So he continues, revivalism, pietism, mysticism and enthusiasm marginalize the cross, pushing it to the side. The man with a good and free will has little need for a dying savior. And you remember that about revivalism, pietism, mysticism, enthusiasm. If you had to find the common denominator in all of these things, they are 
Christian-centered or individual-centered, me-centered um, kinds of theological perspectives. Okay? And then theologies that out, outcrop from that. This idea that I am, I am basically, my will is basically free, my will is basically good, and that that's not true not only for, for me as an individual, but for all people. And so through revivalism, pietism, mysticism, enthusiasm, we're going to um, engage this good and free will. Well, when this becomes the program in the church, Jesus and his saving gifts, the work of God is replaced by the work of man. And the Christian replaces Christ. Okay. So then we get to the terrible situation of the church in Laodicea where Jesus is on the outside knocking. And that's basically where we are here in America. All right, flipping over to 84. And let's just go right up at the top and then we'll pause before we move into the next section here. The cross is God's answer to our sin, Wolf Mueller writes. But we think we are not that bad. The cross is God's answer to his wrath. But we think that God is a nice guy. The cross is God's answer to hell. But we quit believing in judgment years ago. The cross is God's answer. But American Christianity is not asking the right questions. The teaching of the scriptures centers on the cross, pushes to and grows from the cross, begins and ends at the cross. We can see that quite literally. The first book of the Bible, the first gospel, is the bruising of the heel that crushes the serpent's head. There's suffering. And in the very last text of scripture, in Revelation, we see Christ in glory at the throne of heaven before his father and he is the lamb who stands and yet is one having been slain from Genesis to Revelation he is the crucified one well Wolf Mueller continues on the cross God's anger meets his love his righteous wrath collides with boundless compassion and the result is your salvation. How can God be, to use St. Paul's expression, how can God be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus? Only through the cross. That's precisely where those two contrary ideas work out. How can God be both just and let people out of the consequences of their sin. How can he be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus? Only through the cross. That is the only equation that can possibly satisfy that. You know, and this is, this is to go back to the first paragraph here on this page, to do just a little bit of analysis here. You know, it behooves us to kind of think about this. The cross is God's answer to our sin, but we think we are not that bad. Right. I think you can see that in American Christianity. There's this sense in which we're not that bad. There's this really stark and kind of offensive way that the Lutheran divine service begins. The first, the, the, practically the first words out of our mouth are, I, a poor, miserable sinner. How refreshing. <laughs> How refreshing, because the whole world is telling us we're good, and the whole church in America is telling us we're good. And this is even kind of communicated in nonverbal ways by the very casual nature of church. I mean, you're coming to the presence of God Almighty as a sinner. How are you coming? Like it's no big deal. Like God's a golfing friend or, you know, a, a gossip buddy or something. Like, like we sit down, we're casual, we've got our latte, we're ready to be entertained. Um, and this, is not the po uh, this is not the posture of biblical theology, this is the posture of not taking our sin seriously. So the cross is God's answer to our sin, but we're th we think we're not that bad. You can see how these two things hang together. Yes, I see a hand up here. Are we running a microphone right up, right up front? Um, 
when we realize realize that we uh, that we we are sinner, but there are some things that we know that we cannot do that God asks us to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, when we confess and say, well, God, I cannot do this. And because we, we can't do it. But what about, on the other mm-hmm. hand, that Paul says about um, that... Um, if you're going to continue sinning, you know, and Paul says, no, by no means. So what can, how can we work on those <laughs> things? Yeah, I, I always go back to Luther on this one just because he puts it so well. No, no gospel for the flesh. Right? I'm, if I'm using the gospel as an excuse to keep on sinning, it's okay that I keep thinking this, doing this, you know, saying this, because Jesus died, so it's fine. Or Jesus died, and so I, and I, I can't change, and so I'm not even going to try, yeah. kind of thing. Um, that attitude in and of itself, that's, that's gospel meeting the flesh. And it's not for the flesh. The law is for the flesh. So um, what, happens if, what happens, though, if my attitude is penitence? What if I say I'm struggling with this thing? It's written so deeply inside of myself that I can't remember a a living moment, a waking moment where I haven't wrestled with this sin. Lord, have mercy on me. Is that repentant? Yeah, that's, so so what what then for the conscience? If the flesh gets the law, what then for the conscience? The gospel, only the gospel for the conscience. Okay, so um, if you put the law in the conscience, then it's like, I gotta do something. I gotta do enough of something to be right with God. That's what happens if the law goes in the conscience. No law in the conscience, or it's works righteousness, and there's no hope in that. The gospel only in the conscience. What must I do to be saved? Believe. Believe. Ah, and even that belief isn't a work. It's a gift God gives to you. Believe in who? Christ. Which Christ? The Christ that's already been preached to you. Christ crucified for the forgiveness of your sins. Hey, trust him, not yourself. You're forgiven. So that gospel goes for the conscience. Um, we don't let the gospel go into the flesh, otherwise it's antinomianism. If we let the law go into the conscience, it's legalism. You see how that works? You see how if we confuse law and gospel and flesh and conscience, um, then we end up either in antinomianism or legalism. Or some strange combination of the two, because we, have, we are, after all, very complex human beings. So I think, I think there, there a very important question is penitence. I love, I love, now we don't have to, and the church has oftentimes throughout her history not begun divine service with confession absolution. In places where individual confession absolution was much more robust and people were doing this regularly, there was no need to have a kind of corporate confession absolution at the beginning of the service. As that, as that practice is kind of I think sadly fallen by the wayside, confession, absolution at the beginning of service, corporately done, has, has kind of come into vogue and replaced it. Be that as it may, the fact that we have it, I think is fantastic in two different ways. Because there's some times where I walk into the sanctuary, uh, people are always shocked to hear this, like coming from a pastor, I don't know why, pastors are sinners. <laughs> Remember what St. Paul says? He's the chief of sinners. I, I think the pastor feels the same way. How could you not? If you believe the Bible's theology, how could you not? So as, as I come into Sunday morning, I can find myself, let's say, um, between two poles on the spectrum, somewhere between the two poles. And maybe one pole is like having a, having a pretty clean conscience, like feeling okay. And, you know, am I sinless? Of course not. But is my conscience fairly clean? Yeah. Am I, am I feeling like kind of what the Bible would say, like blameless? It's not the same as sinless, eh, but blameless? Um, sure. And, I, and I'm walking to the sanctuary with a, with a kind of a clean heart and, and feeling generally good. Then how do those words, I, a poor, miserable sinner, hit me? Well, like, like, oh yeah, 
That's right. How wholesome. How good. Even though I'm feeling good, I am not thereby justified. <laughs> Even though my conscience is clean, I am not thereby justified. Even though I know of no fault within me, I am not there by justified. And so, so even, even when I'm sort of like doing really well, those words hit me in a really wholesome and healthy way. And now what happens when I'm doing really poorly? What happens when, you know, there was a domestic dispute at the, at the parsonage <laughs> the night before, and maybe it didn't even get resolved. And here we are on a Sunday morning and I'm feeling like I've got to speak the gospel. I've got, to, I've got to take care of this household of God and my own household it, it needs work right this second. I haven't got to that yet, and I'm kind of feeling a shambles. You know, maybe I stayed up too late, um, and, and or whatever else. Maybe I'm just grumpy. And, and I go into service, and those words, I, a poor, miserable sinner, just hit me with full resonance. <laughs> yes. Yes, and, how, and again, how wholesome. That's the word I would use to describe it in both circumstances and everywhere in between those two poles. How wholesome, because it resonates very deeply with me and very deeply with my experience. And I don't have to come before God in some kind of hypocritical joy. You know what kind of American Christianity I'm talking about where like if you don't have a giant smile on your face and if, if you aren't walking perfectly with God, then you're not doing it. And, and so everybody's got this giant smile on their face and kind of this pious like air about them and this everything's going glorious. And in your heart, you're going, I'm a hypocrite. You know, how beautiful it is to be able to walk into the sanctuary and just say, hey, smile on my face or no, genuine or no, I a poor miserable sinner, and that is resonating 100% with me today, and, I am, um, and, and then I've come to the right place. So, so no matter where my mindset is at, clean conscience and feeling blameless, or dirty conscience and feeling like the man who's standing in the temple beating his breast <laughs> saying, Lord, have mercy on me, make atonement for me. Um, wherever I'm at, those words are right. Those words are wholesome. I, a poor, miserable sinner. And of course, as we're making our confession, I, a poor, miserable sinner, no sooner than you, than you look up and what do you see? You see the glorious crucifix above the altar and below the altar, the baptismal font, and you see all the ways in which God has forgiven you and gives that forgiveness to you. Won it once and for all on the cross, pouring that forgiveness from the cross down upon the altar and the font to be received by you. You see Christ crucified and you see the delivery system of baptism and the Lord's Supper, and you go, oh, okay, I'm in the right place. So this idea of, um, you know, this conflict within us um, really, really resonates with this idea of um, we think we're not that bad. Well, when we've got the liturgy in place, we have that reminder, no matter how we're feeling, of we are in fact that bad, but God is in fact that good. And that's why we're there. You know, it's one of the fundamental reasons why you go to church. It's like, you know, well... And this is how a lot of Christians reason. Well, I'm a Christian. I don't need to go to church. And if they have anything intelligent to say beyond that, which usually doesn't happen, um, it's, it's like, well, God hasn't changed. Christ died for my sins. It's, okay, touche, fair point. Um, God hasn't changed, but guess what? You have. And that's, and that's precisely what happens to us day by day, week by week. It's not that God changes. It's not that God's promises change. It's that we change. So the devil is constantly tempting us toward pride or despair. And we, cannot, but st we can't stay in a state of, of stasis. Um, we're constantly being tipped one way or the other. It's a great big spiritual judo match or um, sword and shield and knight and armor battle with the whole armor of God and the sword of the spirit, which is his word. And, we're, we can't go through a single day, we can't go through a single week without being unchanged. And so we come into his presence, win or loss, <laughs> and we say, Lord, have mercy on me, a poor, miserable sinner. We receive his gifts, and he gives to us a clean heart. This is like ground zero of why you go to church. Because my conscience throughout the week has been tempted toward pride or despair or some mixture of the two. I need Christ to set me right, to forgive me and create in me a clean heart. That's why we're there. And then everything else is secondary. Frankly, did you learn something insightful? Great, but secondary. 
Did you feel warm and fuzzy feelings? Fantastic, but secondary. Did you, did you bubble up with jubilation, rejoicing? Great, but that too is secondary. Um, and, and if you didn't have any of those experiences, if you didn't learn something new, if you weren't deeply touched, if you weren't filled with joy, does that mean that it was an unprofitable Sunday? By no means. Christ was there, his word was there, your heart was rendered clean. If nothing else, the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. <laughs> yes, I see a hand in the back. Um, can we toss the microphone over there? Thank you. Yeah, I'm reminded about, in reading all of this, about uh, the young man says, what did Jesus, what do I need to do to enter the kingdom of heaven or whatever? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, follow the Ten Commandments. And the young man says, yeah, I did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, then Jesus says, well, then leave your father and mother and follow me. Yeah, sell everything you have. I yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's not a, it's important for us to, t to understand, uh, you know, what's going on there with a little nuance. Jesus doesn't require all people everywhere to sell everything they have and follow him. But he certainly knew with that rich young man what his weak spot was. Right. And, and we could apply that then more universally. Uh, yeah. Jesus certainly knows what our weak spot is. Yeah, and, and we never see or hear from the young man again. <laughs> Maybe not, Maybe. right? <laughs> There's yeah. some debate as to whether that's a mark. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. You know, and, 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 and the attitude today of you know Christianity or Christians is, well, at least I haven't killed anybody. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is astonishingly like the Pharisees of the first century who thought they had kept the law as long as hey, I didn't murder anyone. And I haven't given my wife a certificate of divorce. I haven't gone and robbed any banks. Therefore, I'm righteous according to the law. It's why the Sermon on the Mount is so powerful, where Christ, you know, really spends, really spends a good seven minutes probably preaching, just overturning this. You have heard it said, you shall not murder, but I tell you, whoever is angry at his brother without cause. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. I tell you, whoever's looked at a woman with lust in his eye. So Jesus is getting down to the root of it, isn't it? Just because you've sort of superficially kept the law doesn't mean you're righteous. Wow. I see a hand in the back, but Barry did you? <laughs> I'm sorry, Barry, I think that's twice. You've been trying to make your own comment. Why, you, you sure may. <laughs> I just wanted to point out to, on, on that story of the rich uh, young ruler, um, this very interesting note that um, after he says, teacher, I, all these I have kept from my youth, Jesus, it, it, the text actually says Jesus looking at him, loved him, mm -hmm. and then preached the law to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so so it's, it's interesting. He didn't just come right out with the gospel. He, <clears throat> you know, like you said, he touched the weak point there. So it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I've heard that text abused theologically in many different ways. It's a much more nuanced and delicate kind of text. You see Jesus' pastoral heart and pastoral care there. It's very interesting. Okay, please. So, um, humanity in general doesn't want to do any work. Uh, the unemployed says, well, I don't want to get off the couch. The check will keep coming. Uh, the youngster in the home uh, it's told to cut the grass. Dad, I, I, I'll cut it tomorrow, you know. But yet, so how do you explain that in spiritual matters where th they want to do the work, they want to save themselves, they want to go on the mission trip to Haiti, and they think that's a counter discredit, you know. We're really saying here American Christianity has, has it upside down, where God has done the work for them. It's a gift and they receive it. Um, it just seems like it's uh, in earthly matters, I don't want to do the work. In spiritual matters, I, I, yeah, I have to do the work. So, mm. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I mean, maybe a longer discourse would be required to really do justice to that, to that topic because it's pretty broad and pretty far-reaching when you talk about work and rest. But maybe we could suffice simply to say, on account of our fallen nature, we, we now view all of work as bad. 
It was shocking to me the first, the first time someone, probably my dad as a Lutheran pastor, probably me as an honorary catechumen in eighth grade, you know, lamenting work and, and um, being so grateful that in heaven there won't be work, there will just be, and, and my father as a pastor say, why do you think there wouldn't be work? In paradise there was work and the work was good. There's nothing r inherently wrong with work. So yeah, as fallen human beings, we have this aversion to work. In fact, I'm aware that there's this, there's this new subreddit. Uh, Reddit's the social media program. There's this new subreddit that's just growing exponentially to the point it's actually hitting mainstream media. The subreddit's name, anti-work. <laughs> anti-work. <laughs> and I, it's very interesting because some of it is just, some of it is just like, hey, um, I, I believe that if you give me a communistic system, I won't have to do anything and I'll uh, be, be profitable. Right. My iPhone will just come in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh. I shouldn't laugh. But what are you going to do if if you don't uh, if you don't laugh, you'll weep. Um, so there's there's all the way from that to pointing out true injustices and getting awfully uncomfortably close to a realization. I think many of us have had that there is a, there is a sense in which um, in a fallen world we have to work. Particularly this curse falls upon the man. You have to work by the sweat of your brow you shall eat. There's a kind of, there's a kind of curse wrapped up into that. Okay? And then that curse can kind of get exploited in different systems. Um, a capitalistic system without any safeguards exploits that. So it's very interesting as you consider work from all these different angles. But maybe I'll add, uh, let me add in one more magical ingredient here. So the first chief ingredient to our conversation would be since the fall, we've got problems with work, okay? The second magical ingredient would be this. Since the fall, we have this thing within us called the opinio legis, which thinks that we can work our way into heaven, work our way into God's graces. Those are probably the two main ingredients in this terrible stew, okay? We don't, we've got a problem with work, and then ironically, we think that work is the way we can please God and enter heaven. I've done more good things than bad. And you find that in paganism, and you find that in the church, whether that's Roman Catholic or evangelicalism. And all of these thoughts are thoughts of the old Adam, not thoughts of God's word. Please. I don't know how to express this exactly, but I've seen it in evangelical places where, you know, you've got these kids that are, are young adults that are just kind of listless, not working, going from pillar to post. But yet they come up with something where they're going to be missionaries or they're going to, you know, do this for the gospel, that for the gospel, and they're going to go build this and do this and do this. And it's almost like they have a work is the antithesis. It's like it's like um, they can't see themselves in a mundane job. Mm -hmm. They want to be looking all saved and do this great work for the church until it almost becomes like I'm a ministry of music, I'm a minister of mm -hmm. carpentry, I'm a minister of the building, I'm a minister of whatever. Mm, and yes. everything else is secondary. It's like not, not, on a, not as high as a spiritual level. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yet if you read Gene V's Got at Work, yes. you realize that everything you do in the mundane world is really glorifying yes. God. Yes, very well said, Alice. If you approach it with the thought that it is God's work. Right. Yes, very well said. So two, two things that, we, that you pointed out that I'll just um, maybe restate. In the first place, what's missing in this kind of scheme of I've got to have a ministry, I've got to be doing my thing is, well, if you probe into why you've got to, what we need is the gospel that a slave doesn't abide in the house forever, but a son. And if the capital S son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If in the capital S son we become sons, we realize that our place in the kingdom isn't dependent upon our work. Any more than my son. He doesn't cease to be my son. Even if he's lousy and disobedient, he doesn't cease to be my son. Okay, so we've got this, we've got this gospel promise that we're not justified by our works. We're not, you know, God is pleased to have us as his children, even if we did nothing. 
even if we squandered and did nothing, he, we're still his children. Now, of course, he wants more than that for us because that's terrible. Who wants to live that way or be that way? That's the first point. And then the second point is that, that as God's children, he calls us to vocations. And so all the mundane stuff, the offices he puts us in, are you a, are you a husband or a wife? Are you a father or a mother? Are you a son or a daughter? Are you a worker or, or an employer? All the, are, are you in government? Are you in the church? It's all of these things are pleasing in God's sight. And so there's no need to create all of these quote unquote Christian works, these ministries. That's this weird thing we've seen going on because the, the biblical doctrine of vocation, vocatio, that God has put you in stations in life and that fulfilling those stations, again, are you a, are you a mother or a father? Are you a husband or wife? Are you a child? Are you a worker? Then conduct yourself within those vocations, within those callings according to the Ten Commandments. That's pleasing to God. But American Christianity has, well, I mean, the evangelicals in particular here, have gone into a new monasticism, while the Roman Catholics have just retained the old monasticism. And the, the new and the old monasticism say this, no, 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 all that stuff doesn't matter. What really matters are these special religious things. And so you become the minister of coffee or the minister of mission work, or you go to a, a, a cloister or out in the desert and pray all the time or whatever. You have to create these, these special spiritual offices that aren't in the Bible. That's the thing. And that um, are totally misconstrued as if, as if the rest of life that God had given and living your life quietly according to the Ten Commandments wasn't God-pleasing. That's the very thing that is God-pleasing. So uh, the, large, yeah, the large catechism has much to say about this, um, particularly, I think, in the Fourth Commandment, which we've been covering. There's plenty there. So um, thank you for those, those insights, Alice. Yes, please. Um, with the parable of the wedding feast, mm -hmm. all these little details really, like you said, is secondary because the main picture there is that God is preparing the bride for Jesus. So um, we're going through all these, the whole journey is to become the bride. Mm, yes. And it's all God's work. Like, putting people together or put, putting his church together just to bring in the bright for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's a very interesting idea, a very dynamic idea that you have. There's, there's some scholars who have put forward this idea. Um, if, if John the evangelist who wrote the Gospel of John is also the author of Revelation, which we have very good reason to believe that's the case, then you know how Luke and Acts are really one book. They're both written by Luke then John and Revelation would really kind of be one book written by John. One interesting lens to kind of see those two works through is that John is the preparation of the groom, the preparation of Jesus. Revelation is the preparation of the bride culminating with the groom and bride coming together in Revelation 21 and 22. Very interesting. Um, and there are themes to bear that out. It's more than just creativity. There's, uh, there are themes to bear that out. For example, as you see Jesus go along in John's Gospel, there are various times where there's this kind of um, like tension, like is, is this the person Jesus might marry? Um, do you remember in the Old Testament this motif of, uh, oh, who is it off the top of my head? I can't remember now off the top of my head, but the meeting of the, of the bride-to-be at the well, do you remember this? Who is that? Is that, um, Perry, do you know who's, uh, it's J Jacob? Uh, it's the bride for Jacob? No, it's Isaac. It's Rebe Isaac and Rebecca, that's yeah. who it is? Yeah, he sends the uh, servant down. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. exactly right. And so she's met at the well, she remember the that? Well. Yeah, and remember in John 4 how Jesus meets the woman at the well? And she's got five husbands and one who is not her husband. Jesus would be the, the seventh. There's these kinds of hints and, uh, and allusions to like, would this be the one? Would this? And, and of course the answer is yes and no. It's complicated. Only insofar as she is brought into the church. 
only in so far as he gathers all the believers all the way along. Um, and then, and so what you see is the preparation of the groom as he marches toward the cross, and um, then the preparation of the bride as, as she marches toward, toward him in heaven as the crucified, and then the, the culmination in the new heavens and the new earth. So, yeah, some beautiful themes and thoughts there to work out in uh, John and Revelation. I'm sorry I wasn't sharper on that point. I wasn't expecting to, to talk about this this morning. Okay. So, um, any other things we want to add in terms of this idea of, um, you know, thinking we're not that bad, top of page 84? Um, okay, well, the other would be then the cross is God's answer to his wrath, and along with thinking we're not that bad, well, then that's, you know, it's kind of the chick, all of this stuff is the chicken and the egg. Did we first think that God was not that wrathful, <laughs> and then we thought we were not that bad? Or did we think we're not that bad, and therefore God can't be that wrathful? Who knows? But we're opposed to God's wrath. You know, uh, one, of the, one of the ways that you can think of wrath is just justice. And if you think about this, like, like if God isn't wrathful, then he isn't just. And if he isn't just, you really don't want anything to do with him. As if he's not, if he's not just, what's the difference between God and Satan? Um, who, who, wants the kind of, who wants the kind of judge, remember how Jesus tells this, this story, who wants the kind of judge that an injustice has been done to you, there's none to help, you beg the judge to help, you present your evidence, it's overwhelming in your favor, and still he won't answer, still he won't give you justice. We've got, we've got a, other names and words for a judge like that, don't we? Corrupt, wicked, incompetent, bought out, fit to be deposed. Right? And now Jesus' point, ironically, in that, in that part, is even if you nag a wicked judge, eventually he might cave. And his point is, how much more then will your loving Father, who is a good and just judge, give you justice in due time? Continue praying. Okay. So, when, you know, this whole idea of like, you know, and I've heard this preached even in Lutheran circles of like, well, you don't want a God who's just, her, 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 um, because look how he would treat you. Well, okay, that's real ham-fisted. And that lends itself much more to abuse than anything else, because... Um, no, you do want a God who's just. You also want a God who's merciful. You want a God who's just, but the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Okay? We're not going to exchange justice for grace as if the two were necessarily pitted against each other. They're not. They're only pitted against each other in a, in a way that's resolved in Christ. So we do want a just God, and we do have a just God. Um, you know, think of a, think of a husband who... Um, who doesn't care if his children hate him, despise him, mock him, disobey him, cause all kinds of havoc and harm to others. And, and the father goes, well, I just love them so much I could never discipline them. What kind of father is that? A bad father. We don't have a bad father. What kind of judge is it who doesn't execute justice? A bad judge. We don't have a bad judge. Um, what kind of husband is it who, if his wife is... Um, you know, cheating on him. Um, he just says, well, I don't care. I'll take her anyway. Uh, not a good husband. Not a good husband. We don't have a God who is a husband like that. And so um, we have a God who is just, and thus a God who is justly angry at sin. And, and not just because, like, not just in the sense either of like, well, you've broken my rule. I mean, sure. Sure. Can I, as a father, if I set a rule in the house, I want it to be kept no matter what, and I might be irritated, <laughs> okay? But even more so because what? Because of what that's doing to your character and your nature and disobeying that, but then you're gonna hurt and harm yourself, but then you're gonna hurt and harm others, right? And so that's the whole point. So yeah, we want a God who's wrathful. Frankly, if we don't have a God who's wrathful, we don't have a God who's just, we don't have a God who's worth anything. And so we need to, you know, this, this God is a nice guy. I mean, that's the big problem. We don't want a, a quote-unquote nice guy or a nice God um, who's wicked. We want a God who's just and righteous and good. All right, and then, and then so we're, we're tying all these themes together, you know. American Christianity, we think we're not that bad. American Christianity, um, we think God is, is, isn't wrathful. He's just a nice guy in the sky. 
And then Wolf Mueller continues, the cross is God's answer to hell, but we quit believing in judgment years ago. The cross is God's answer, but American Christianity is not asking the right questions. Who in the Bible talks about hell more than anyone else? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. So we want a theology that is thoroughly biblical, a theology that talks about sin, that talks about wrath, that talks about judgment. We want that. Because if we have those things, guess what else fits perfectly? The cross. And the gracious means of escaping justice that God has given to us in Jesus. That sweet exchange of Christ taking our sins as his own and giving us his righteousness as our own. Without any merit or worthiness, but as a free gift of God. Because God is not only just, he is also good. That's what we want. And that's what we have. And that's what we want to keep then. Um, so American Christianity has bailed on all of these things, and they're all of a piece. If you lose the cross, you lose sin, you lose wrath, you lose judgment. If you lose wrath, or sin, and judgment, you lose the cross. And so we want all of these things back together. They're hallmarks of biblical Christianity. All right, what we're going to do now with Wolf Mueller is shift gears, and we're going to take a look at um, the nature of the cross, where Christ won our atonement. Um, we're going to look at it in terms of physical suffering, in terms of shame, which is a kind of, I would almost say, psychological suffering, and then, last but not least, spiritual suffering. So that'll be our meditation in the next few pages, and I'm going to skip around in these categories and just try to give you the gist of Wolf Mueller's points. Um, but before we transition, any other thoughts on sort of this more general point that Wolf Mueller's been making in the text? One more up front here. You know, the term Acadia that we kind of discovered a couple days or a couple weeks ago in the uh, Book of Concord, Acadia, that uh, yeah. uh, you have the ability to uh, somehow lapse into what we've been talking about and um, to where you think you're good enough. It, my question is, would that term fit what we're talking about here, do you think? Um, Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So let, can I do a little description sure. just briefly to yeah. bring everybody yeah. else? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Sometimes pronounced Acadia, sometimes Acedia. Um, it really um, means uh, spiritual, and that's really important, spiritual sloth or spiritual apathy. And it goes by another, it goes by kind of another synonym, security. Okay security so that it's kind of like it's kind of this attitude I mean it can take on any manifestation but let me, let me give you a concrete example it's kind of like well Jesus died for me and I know that and I'm secure in that so now I can do whatever I want and what I want to do is just kind of this laziness this spiritual sloth or apathy and that and what what really dovetails with that as you as you're pointing out is my sins aren't that bad. I don't have to take them that seriously. Ah, judgment isn't really going to happen. If it does, it's just Christ blessing me. Um, God is not really angry. He doesn't expect it. I mean, it, and what kind of starts to go along with this is just bare minimum Christianity. So we start asking these questions. What's the least possible I can do to be saved? What's the least possible I can be to still be Christian? What's the least possible I can do? And so you start like this theology and then everything gets distorted. And I've noticed this, I've noticed this and the kinds of questions that people ask. It's like bare minimum Christianity. What's the least possible someone can do to be saved? And you know, if you answer belief, okay, well let's parse out belief and see if you could have like the belief of a crumb, would that still get you into heaven? Okay, and you know, so on and so forth. The whole idea of paving this way toward, I can just live and be and do however I want and um, no one's gonna tell me anything. Yeah. Yeah, right. It takes on these concrete manifestations. Yes, and I hear this. I hear this from time to time as well. Like, I, I was baptized as a child, so I'm good. <laughs> Nobody can say anything. I was confirmed 50 years ago. Uh, 
I was confirmed in this church before you were even here. Well, I've been here a long time. I haven't seen you. <laughs> um, this, this kind of sense of, of own, uh, uh, this false sense of ownership, and I'm in, and I'm secure, and I got this, and nobody can tell me anything. Um, that's this spiritual condition that kind of manifests. And I think, I think from time to time you can see this... Um, Roman Catholic piety is less set up for this because Roman Catholic piety, one of the chief virtues is being insecure and uncertain as to whether you're going to heaven. But evangelicalism is set up with this idea of, no, you need to be certain you're going to heaven. And then it kind of coale- it can coalesce anyway in this idea of like, um, okay, I'm certain I'm going to heaven, but I'm not that bad and judgment isn't that serious and God's a nice guy and look how casual and relaxed everything is and, you know, it, it lends itself to a kind of self-righteous security, a kind of apathy, a kind of no one can tell me anything. And that, yeah, so we want to avoid that. We want to avoid that. Um, <laughs> a lot of folks say that spiritual apathy is really the disease of our times in all kinds of different manifestations, it's really the disease of our times. And there may be something to that. Okay, thank you for that. Any, uh, any other thoughts? All right, so then going into this next section, um, middle of page 84, I just want to read you quickly the introduction. So forsaken by God, really forsaken. Wolf Mueller writes, we know that the suffering of Jesus on the cross is important, but how is it that the suffering and death of Jesus wins my salvation? Martin Luther has helpfully identified three distinct types of suffering Jesus endured on the cross physical pain, shame, and spiritual agony. Okay, so over on, um, well, right here at the bottom, you see suffering part one, and then over on the top of page 85 in giant font, you see physical suffering. And I don't intend to go through all of this, um, but even if you look at that indented text, it's a quotation of Psalm 22. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. So a a biblical meditation from the Old Testament on some of the physical aspects of the crucifixion. Um, I am poured out like water. Very, very heavy, heavy theological line. Um, Not only because of the baptismal connection, but because of what Jesus says, out of me will come living waters and everyone will drink. In order order for us to receive those living waters, he must be poured out. All my bones are out of joint. Wolf Mueller talks about um, some of the mechanics of crucifixion, um, how it's very easy to have your shoulders pulled out of joint. And, and may well have happened to our Lord. We don't know conclusively unless you take this as conclusive evidence. Uh, in Mel Gibson's Passion, that seems to be the case. They show one of his shoulders dislocating. My heart is like wax, is a poetic expression of exactly what happens to the heart. You basically die of heart failure, a combination of kind of suffocation and heart failure on the cross. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. Remember as he says, I thirst. I thirst. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs encompass me. Obviously dogs, kind of poetic synonym for um, the wicked. Sometimes particularly Gentiles. A company of evildoers encircles me. Of course, everyone's mocking him, crucifying him. On the dogs that encompass him, well, the Roman soldiers, if he wanted to make that specific to the Gentiles. Jew and Gentile are complicit in the crucifixion of Jesus. Very important fact. Um, Very important. In the same way that Adam and Eve fall, um, it's all of humanity. In the same way that Jew and Gentiles crucify him, it's all of humanity. They have pierced my hands and feet. I mean... This is just one of the jaw-dropping moments for me in Scripture of like, like if this were not from God, how could this be? How could it be that David pens this psalm 
meditating on the Christ and the sufferings of Christ a thousand years before it happens, and it happens. How could it be other? How could it possibly be other? And that Christianity blows up the way it's blown up, a completely gr global religion um, that's, been, that's been spread everywhere. And it was foretold a thousand years earlier, and the specific nature of it. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. How can you count all your bones if you're stripped naked? They stare and gloat over me. Thus the staring and the gloating over, the shame. Uh, you couldn't come up with a better description of the cross, and it's written a thousand years before the cross. That's just, it's one of those moments where it's like, if that doesn't make you a Christian, I don't know what your problem is. <laughs> so, so the physical suffering is certainly an aspect. You know, God's Christ takes all our sins upon him. There is a, uh, in thought, word, and deed, and, and our sins become his sins, and there is a spiritual um, suffering that takes place on our behalf and that makes atonement for our sins. Now, it's not the physical suffering alone, and sometimes that's the, uh, the focus is so much on the physical suffering of Jesus um, that we lose the other components, the aspect of shame and the aspect of uh, the spiritual suffering, both of which, I, Wolf Mueller makes the argument, I think he's right, um, that the, both the shame and the spiritual suffering are even worse than the physical suffering. Okay, um, so suffering part two, bottom of 85, and he begins, Wolf Mueller begins with this interesting observation. The four Gospels focus on the second type of suffering, the shame of the cross. Flipping over to 86, you'll see shame in great big letters. And again, I commend this to you. I'm simply going to point out a few of the, the, the things that Wolf Mueller does. So they spit in his face. Um, and so not only are they you know, beating him, but there's this, there's this shame. They're publicly despising him in really the most despicable ways we humans can. Um, they mock him. You know, he was called the king of the Jews. He, you know, David's son. And so they wrap him up in purple and beat him. And they're all saying, you know, oh, hail to the king and crown him with thorns. All of this is complete mockery and rejection of what he says. And if you've, ever, if you've ever known that something is true and stood up for something that is true, the suffering and the rejection and the mockery of that hurts deeper than physical pain. It really does. It, the loss of one's reputation, you know, is, is worse than... Um, it's worse than, than physical loss, than loss of physical health due to a beating or something like that. Um, it is, it's a more profound pain, this shame. So there's the spitting and the mocking um, down toward the bottom of 86. Wolf Mueller makes a point, and again, this is very much obvious. It just may not be obvious to you. I don't mean this for shock value, but of course, Jesus was stripped naked on the cross. The, the loincloth that we see on the crucifix is there for piety's sake. Real life, the Romans weren't so kind. And this was complete suffering and com complete humiliation. The sign above his head, King of the Jews, was meant as complete mockery of him and um, a, a complete warning shot to the Jewish people. You want to think about insurrection? You want to think about having a king other than Caesar? This is what's going to happen to your king and you. Uh, it's a complete mockery, stripped naked, um, you know, and consider that. You'd, you'd probably rather be beaten in any number of ways than placarded up like a billboard for all to see and mock in complete nakedness and shame, weakness, uh, inability to help yourself. So um, we add this to the consideration of, of shame. And then also um, this, this occurs in a public place near the gate to the city. Everybody who's coming in sees this. Um, this is over on 87. Wolf Mueller gives us this. The charges posted above his head. Jesus, quote unquote, crime. You know, and that's the thing, too. Uh, even though we're sinners, how do you like to be falsely accused of something? Now, how would you like to be publicly found guilty of that false accusation 
and die despised by everyone as being guilty, as an insurrectionist, a liar, a blasphemer. I mean, Christ is crucified in the eyes of the Jews for being the worst of all heretics, in the eyes of the Romans being a, a traitor, an insurrectionist. By the way, that's hidden in the Greek language. It's probably not two robbers who are crucified next to Jesus, even though that fits a certain biblical theme and motif. I think the word is leistes, and that's um, insurrectionist. Um, Barabbas also is, um, is uh, remember how in the, in the English gospel is Barabbas. Now he was a robber, except that's not what he says. He was a leist, he was a insurrectionist. So Jesus is crucified as an insurrectionist, he's, even though he's not. His life is exchanged for an insurrectionist's life. And what's an insurrectionist? A rebel. I mean, look at how poetic and typological this is. What are we? Rebels. I mean, what is our, what is our, if you were to s summarize our chief crime, we've rebelled against God. We're rebels. So the, w the only one who isn't a rebel <laughs> dies as if he were a rebel, an insurrectionist, a traitor. So all of this is laid upon Jesus, who is truly innocent. And this, this profound shame, I mean, I, I think this last paragraph of Wolf Mueller summarizes it nicely on page 87, the last paragraph in this second part. The shame of the cross is profound. In many ways, it is worse than the physical suffering of the cross. And Jesus is holy and perfect. He deserves none of these things. And you want to consider the the humility and meekness of Jesus, it's that all of this happens and he opens not his mouth. He doesn't even rush to his defense. Could he not have given a defense? He could have. Could he not have exonerated himself? Could, have. could he not have pointed out that this was a, a circus and a charade and, a, and a, a, just a false calamity? He absolutely could have. He didn't. When I consider that, I consider how far I am from humility, how far I am from meekness. So there's the shame. Now I see that we've, um, we've run right up against our time. So next week, then we'll jump into the deepest of all of the aspects of our Lord's passion and crucifixion, um, namely the spiritual suffering that takes place. Um, and we'll, we'll discuss that then in light of these other things as well. Um, again, what, what is the point of all of this? Well, in all of this, we see the depths of his love for us. We see this twofold reflection on our sin is truly that bad. God's justice is truly that good. That this was the only way in which we poor, miserable sinners could be saved. And he has done it. He so loved us, though we were his enemies, that he did it. And we'll meditate a little next week, even as we did in our service this morning, on Christ's perfect fulfillment of the law on the cross as he loves God, even though God forsakes him on account of our sins. Christ perfectly loves God. And even though all of humanity forsakes him, even to the point of murdering him unjustly, he lays down his life in perfect love for his neighbor, perfect love for his enemies and for us. And even says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. So we'll spend even more time meditating on the glory of Christ, the love of God revealed in him next week. The Lord be with you.